And we really do have a really interesting group of panelists today. And what we would really like to do is promote an interactive discussion with the panelists, specifically amongst the students in the audience, um, to discuss opportunities while at Cornell to better position yourselves for careers once you leave CALS. Um, and then also, what careers exist within the international development landscape for students with varying interests. Uh, and we have, we have microphones set up in the audience for the Q&A portion of the discussion. Uh, but we'll begin with uh, short bios from each panelist, uh, and then we'll lead into an uh, interactive Q&A portion. Great. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, Anna Herforth. Um, she is a consultant specializing in nutrition as a multi-sectoral issue related to agriculture and the environment. She consults for the World Bank, the UN FAO, and USAID Spring Project. Uh, she has worked with universities, uh, nonprofit organizations um, on issues related to food and nutrition in Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. She holds a PhD from Cornell University in international nutrition with a concentration in international agriculture and an MS in food policy from Tufts, um, and her BS is also from Cornell in plant science. Um, and interestingly, she is a founder, um, a founding member of the Ag to Nutrition uh, Community of Practice, and we're very happy to have her here today. So thank you, Anna. Thank you for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be back and uh, seeing a lot of people here who I <laughs> spent quite a lot of time with uh, in all of the years that I was studying here. Um, so it's it's... It's great to come back in this um, venue. And um, I know it's probably because it's before the break, there aren't that many students. And I think my role on this panel is sort of uh, because I was, it's not been very long since I've actually been here as a student, um, you know, sort of go through the recent process of going, transitioning from student to um, a career outside of academia. And so, so I'm going to talk some about that. And for the students who are here, I hope that's helpful. And for faculty who have <laughs> been more of the mentors for me, um, I hope that you see yourselves in <laughs> everything that I'm talking about. So um, a formative experience des definitely describes um, my experience here in international programs in CALS in, in both of my degrees at Cornell. And I'll start by just saying what I do now. And um, about four years ago, I started working for the World Bank. And that was actually before I quite finished my thesis. And um, they hired me. I was working in the, uh, for the health nutrition population unit there, um, not in a specific region, but with a global uh, remit. And the nutrition unit there had been focused for many years on very specific nutrition interventions, um, like you know more on vitamin supplements and um, growth monitoring promotion, sort of things that were very specifically related to child growth improvement. And the leader there, um, Mira Shekhar, at the time wanted to branch out more into multi-sectoral, uh, how, nu how nutrition could be improved multi-sectorally. So that's why I was brought in to work there and um, have worked on that issue for the past four years. And uh, ultimately, our work there resulted in, in this is one of the publications, um, a pretty large guidance document on improving nutrition through multi-sectoral approaches. And we've done a lot of work within the World Bank, kind of, it's a lot of internal advocacy for nutrition, particularly I've worked on it through agriculture, and how the bank, which invests a lot of money in agriculture development, can um, improve nutrition impact through their work. And, and so we've you know, produced this document, and actually, um, Pierre Pinster of Anderson here was involved in a background paper to that, uh, which I also worked on with Andy Jones, another student, and what we're trying to do is, you know, the document is one thing, but not just have it sit there. There's continuing work to, um, you know, with the actual uh, program managers in agriculture to try to make some of this guidance happen. So that's what I've been doing for the bank. Um, I actually worked full time there for the first year and then became a consultant working remotely. Uh, that coincide, coincided with the birth of my daughter. And I wanted to um, be able to 
uh, feed her the way that we recommend <laughs> infants should be fed in nutrition and leaving for only a few weeks wouldn't have permitted me to do that so I became a consultant working from home and um, kind of with much fear and trepidation we can talk more about that in Q&A if anybody wants but uh, it actually resulted really well in the end because it uh, opened up the possibility for working for other institutions as well. And so uh, about three years ago, I started working with the, uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. And what I was doing with the FAO um, kind of pitched this idea that, you know, the World Bank was not the only institution that was looking at this issue of linking agriculture and nutrition. There are a lot of institutions thinking about that right now. And a lot that was being produced and talked about and published by many institutions. And it, um, it seemed important to look at the whole gamut and try to see, are, is anybody saying the same things? Is this just a cacophony? Or what, what can be said out of all of these initiatives and seminars and publications? And so they sponsored me to do the synthesis of what, is, what has been written on the topic, um, coming out with a synthesis of guiding principles on agriculture programming for nutrition. And what, what turned out happening is that there is actually a whole lot that is being said um, in common for many institutions and kind of putting that together. And a major part of, of this work at, for FAO, in fact, was the agriculture to nutrition community of practice. Um, and I want to talk a little about this because it really has roots from Cornell. Um, Emily Levitt and I were grad students together in nutrition. And while we were here, saw the need to bring agriculture and nutrition together on campus. And with a lot of faculty, some of whom are in this room, started the Food, Ag, and Nutrition Group. And that is still going. I know Jane was, uh, part of leading that, and that's great to see. And Emily and I were both then, after Cornell, working in Washington. We were both working on these issues. Um, she was at a different institution, linking ag and nutrition. We were like, kind of talking together, and wouldn't it be great to bring this ag and nutrition group to a global scale? And so she really spearheaded that and started this group, which um, at the time in 2010, it was five people. <laughs> Emily and I were two, and there were three other friends who were also working on this. And we started an online community, and there's just, just been so much interest. It grew and grew, and um, now it has 800 members from 55 countries. And this group was instrumental in, um, in the FAO review of pointing out all of, all of their own publications, what everybody's working on this topic, and um, put, reviewing it. And we, our group, decided that what we really needed was something even shorter than um, the FAO synthesis report, and we've come, this Ag to Nutrition group has come to a one-page description of what basically is a consensus among international organizations on improving nutrition through agriculture. And that now is being used um, by many, many institutions um, more informally at this point, but I, um, I know ACF International World Vision has been using it in their programming, and um, USAID is using it uh, in theirs, which I actually had a role in because I started consulting for the Spring Project, um, which has done a review of Feed the Future programs, um, the major food security program out of the U.S. government that's running in 19 countries. And they, are, they wanted this review to see how Feed the Future could improve what they're doing for nutrition. And so because USAID, USAID uh, employees were part of the Ag to Nutrition community practice, part of the process of coming to this one-page consensus on um, kind of key recommendations for improving <laughs> nutrition. Uh, USAID is actually starting to uh, use those principles in the Feed the Future work in, in their 19 countries. Um, so that's another example of, of how this consensus has been built and how it's starting to be used. And, and you know, the Cornell experience just had a lot to do with that because that was the model for coming creating a community where people could share uh, what they're doing and come to some common ground and, and make that available to the world and have it be useful. So um, and definitely, you know, when I recognize Emily, who had a major role in, in stepping up the fang, <laughs> Cornell fang, to a global level. Um, so now I'll go in, back and talk more about how the 
what I learned, my international experience here also uh, informed everything that I'm working on right now. And uh, it started actually with the very first course I took here, uh, Plants, Genes, and Global Food Production, taught by Susan McCooch. I actually took that course. I started uh, knowing about that course before I even got to Cornell. It was the one I sat in on as a pre-frosh, um, deciding whether I was going to come. And it was so on target with what I was interested in. I thought, I have to come <laughs> to Cornell. And it was the very first course I took. Then the next summer, I went with one of her grad students to Mexico and helped. Uh, that was Ellie Rice, and I helped her. Um, in her interviews of farmers about why they grow certain varieties of maize. And um, then later, when I came back to Cornell, I joined Susan's other, she has a course, uh, an international rice research to production course, and uh, so ended up joining that as well, and getting to go to the Philippines and learn how to drive a catabao. And uh, if any students are here that haven't taken it, it is fantastic course. And basically, you know, from all this experience, uh, from kind of the, the plant breeding and um, international, um, the, the CGR agencies, what I, what I took out of it was, you know, first of all, why farmers, some insights into why farmers do what they do, why they make certain choices about varieties, um, workloads. You know, I was exhausted after one day of <laughs> trying to grow rice. It's just a lot of work. So some insights into the practicalities of what farmers deal with. Um, and then also the, uh, the, the genetic resources that are uh, held ex situ and the gene banks both in Mexico at Simit and, and the Philippines in Erie. Um, so that, that exposure was really, really helpful. Another, there, there's a whole lot of things I could talk about, but probably the one other major influence was um, the programs that Eloy Rodriguez held here. And that's, I think he's on medical leave right now, and so his programs aren't running anymore, but um, he had these amazing undergraduate programs in Dominican Republic and the Amazon for uh, really training undergraduates in biodiversity research. And so I did both of those, and they were truly life-changing. And this one in the Amazon um, spent a summer in Peru, traipsing around the jungle and talking to midwives and shamans about the plants that they use for various uh, ailments. Um, I focused on fungal mycoses and the plants that are used to treat those. We collected the plants that they talked about and ground them up in our forest laboratory, extracted them into alcohol, and then I came back uh, my senior year and studied them in the lab. And um, it was amazing how many of them actually were very bioactive against fungal growth when I tested them in the lab. And that was my senior thesis here. So, what I took from that was really the, the amazing value of traditional knowledge and, um, again, how people use biodiversity. So that has been something lasting that I you know, use all the time. Um, the year after I graduated was really kind of a, a fallow time, I would say. Um, I didn't get any international exciting jobs that I imagined, um, but that I couldn't really find. The only skills that people seemed to want to hire me for were those Petri dish skills that I had. So um, I did end up taking a lab job actually here on campus in molecular medicine. Uh, stayed there for a year. It was not where I wanted to be. So um, I actually ended up finding myself again by picking up the Cornell course catalog and thumbing through it and circling things that I was interested in. And to my surprise, most of the dog-eared pages were on nutrition. And so I started thinking, well, maybe the only way to get where I want to be, which is working internationally um, on food issues and um, agriculture issues, is if I go back to grad school. So I did. I applied to a bunch of schools, went to Tufts for the food policy uh, masters, and had some experience in South Asia there, uh, worked in India for half a year, and then ended up coming back to Cornell um, because really I couldn't find anywhere else that had the strength in international nutrition and international agriculture, both, that I really wanted to combine. So um, came back here and 
uh, started a PhD in, in the International Nutrition Program and worked with uh, Professor Per Pinstrup Anderson, uh, who is, of course, a world renowned figure in um, poverty reduction and hunger and linking agriculture and nutrition. Uh, so, with, with Per as my advisor, um, I started to do research in central Kenya, which is pictured here, and northern Tanzania on a project that was promoting the production and consumption of and marketing of traditional African vegetables. And I was looking at how that affected diets in the farmer households, and especially for children. And these were areas where there was both, uh, both undernutrition as well as obesity and chronic disease. So it seemed like growing traditional vegetables um, was something that would be good for both of those nutritional problems. So um, I talked to a whole lot of farmers and uh, sometimes there were chickens, and um, among these, they're, they're, in addition to the focus groups, there were, we did 500 uh, household surveys to get um, quantitative information and looked at everything from, um, and sometimes I got to do really fun and helpful, maybe a little bit, <laughs> things to give back to the farmers for all the information that they were giving to me in these surveys and discussions. Um, and basically learned about how the vegetables were produced and marketed and prepared and consumed and how much they're available and their prices in markets and, um, and tried to look at the whole system and what it would mean for nutrition. Um, and I think through all of that, I really still kept those undergraduate international experiences from you know, looking at, l with the perspective of traditional knowledge. And it turned out here that actually farmers were very motivated by traditional knowledge of health benefits and medicinal benefits of these vegetables, much more motivated by that than by nutrition education about micronutrients, for example. Um, so having that perspective of how, how people think about health um, really transferred to this, this PhD work. And, um, and also the value in diversity, how you know, farmers were, were growing different varieties of the same vegetables, and they had very, very good reasons for that. Um, and so that experience that I got from Susan's course, um, taking that to, to this research as well. Um, so I think there's a lot more that, uh, that we could talk about in the Q&A um, that I could share. But I also, just if I have a couple more minutes, <laughs> I wanted to, to story tell a little bit. I couldn't think of a better venue to tell this since it's called Cal's The Formative Experience. <laughs> Cal's was actually really quite a formative experience in a literal way for me. Um, and I have, to, I have to give a shout out here to Liberty Hyde Bailey who um, formed, he founded Cal's and uh, is very much responsible for my existence many times over. And <laughs> I'll tell you why that is. So um, my great-grandparents here, my great-grandfather, um, George F. Warren, came to Cornell to study with Liberty Hyde Bailey. And my great-grandmother, there at the bottom, came to study with An Anna Botsford Comstock. And they met at Liberty Hyde Bailey's house in an open house that he held for Cal students. <laughs> it goes on. <laughs> So my grandfather, who's at the upper right, wait, I have a pointer, my grandfather here, um, Stanley Warren, he then taught for 40 years in um, the Department of Agricultural Economics, uh, oh, which I forgot to mention, my great-grandfather founded. So, um, <laughs> so then my grandfather taught here for, for 40 years. Um, he met my grandmother, who was in, in home economics at the time, also in Cal's. I don't know if Bailey had anything to do with that. But then um, my parents also both went to Cornell, and they met on a blind date at Bailey Hall in 1966 when Van Cliburn was here playing. Um, and then 20-some years later, I met my husband at Bailey Hall um, when he was playing a concerto and I was in the Cornell Symphony, Daniel Kim, who's in the center here. Um, so I really have to thank Cal's for the truly formative experience. <laughs>
And I don't know if there's going to be a fifth generation, but we're hopeful. <laughs> so that's my daughter, Ella, who's three. Um, and believe it or not, I did not have any pressure to come to Cornell. <laughs> I actually really came here because I wanted to, um, because it was exactly the kind of worldview and the kind of opportunities, especially the international opportunities, that I personally felt really strongly about. And um, I don't remember pressure from my family, although some, some kind of, I don't know, nature or nurture, some of it must have filtered through. Um, because I keep being surprised the more I learn. I actually, um, while I was doing my PhD, I was walking around Warren Hall and saw this little display case about Warren. And um, it had this picture of one of uh, my great-grandfather's survey teams in 1908, and he was one of the first to do farm surveys and collect data actually about the economics of farm management. Um, and it just kind of, it knocked me over because the same year I had just come back from Kenya um, and there's my survey team. Uh, actually, it was six people as well um, doing farm surveys, collecting data. So it's Cal's sponsored tradition of <laughs> um, finding you know, truth through survey research and on farms somehow has filtered through the generations. And then this is another um, picture of my great-grandfather, George F. Warren, 1908. Um, in his study at Cornell, and I actually wrote my thesis on the very same desk. Uh, the equipment changed a little bit, but I think the learning process here is uh, kind of similar 100 years later. Um, so uh, it, it's, it, it runs deep for me, and I, I actually want to end with this quote that uh, some of you may recognize as inscribed uh, on Warren Hall, and my great-grandfather did not choose this quote, but I know he liked it, and I, as an undergrad, I walked by and didn't really get it, um, and now I find it really meaningful, and I think it's just a perfect quote to describe an educational institution, and especially one that's centered on agriculture, and especially one that has a worldwide reach, um, and it's basically about how education and all the you know, professors, colleagues, fellow students are sowing seeds. That's what education is about, and that's what international experience for students is about, is sowing seeds. And um, I know from my experience that sometimes it, there are fallow times, um, but as long as it's, it's um, truly what you're, uh, you know, you, you, whatever is sown in truth for you that is um, what you'd like to nurture, that is what I think Cal's offers, and that's what it offered to me. So uh, I found this quote very meaningful, and um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk about it here. Thank you, Ann, and I also wanted to jump in for a quick PSA. We're running a Twitter feed with the hashtag IPCALS50, so if we have any tweeters in the audience, or as the, the PM of Canada would say, twerkers, Anybody? No? Nobody picked up on that? Okay. It was kind of big news, but it's funny. Um, but please feel free to tweet any uh, responses, suggestions, questions. We would love to hear from you via the Twitter feed. So. Thanks. And thank you so much, Anna, for sharing um, a bit about your career trajectory with us. And although I don't think a lot of us can say that we have such a connection with Cornell, um, your recent transition into the, into the workforce is something that's really relevant to a lot of the grad students here. Um, so that was very insightful, thank you. Um, so we'll shift gears a bit and I'll introduce our next speaker. Um, so Joe DeVries uh, began a career, his career as a UN volunteer in West Africa in the late 1980s after completing degrees in crop physiology um, at NC, NC State and the University of Florida. Um, after obtaining his PhD from Cornell University in plant breeding, um, he joined the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and later in 2005, um, Joe um, helped to conceive um, the improved varieties, um, the PASS, excuse me, the PASS um, program for Africa seed system, um, which was the first initiative of AGRA, the Alliance for the an African Green Revolution. Um, and he has been the president for that initiative since 2007 in Nairobi. So we're very happy to have you here today, Joe. Thank you. Wonderful to be here uh, with you all and see some very familiar faces and some less familiar faces. 
I think three of my four uh, former advisors for my PhD are in the room. I don't know where Dr. Sisler is, but um, <clears throat> okay. But uh, uh, it is great to be back at Cornell, and I kind of look at this as a chance to update the shareholders on our project so far. <laughs> Some of you, as you know, are still very much involved in the work that I'm going to be talking about here. And uh, for those of you who uh, are less familiar with the, the work I'm going to be talking about, all I can say is uh, um, listen in, um, contribute what you have to contribute to the idea uh, process of trying to overcome food insecurity in Africa. That is what I'm going to talk about. That's what uh, my career has focused on. It really moved into um, overdrive once I left Cornell. I think the thing that I usually attribute Cornell to, um, to my career was this, uh, this commitment that the institution has for independent thinking, scientific freedom, and freedom of thought with regard to finding solutions. Long may it live. And uh, we, uh, together, some of us, poured a lot of that thinking into what we now call an organization we now call AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which was actually <clears throat> the seeds of which were sown at the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation and the Gates Foundation created AGRA together uh, in about 2006, uh, depending very heavily on the leadership and administrative capacities of Peter Matlin, who's up here on the days with me today. And uh, we've gone through this process, I think, uh, 1998 to 2002, when Bob was the, leading the work of food security at the Rockefeller Foundation, basically said, you've got a credit card. Uh, go out and find out why Africa hasn't uh, got its green revolution yet. And um, I came back after a while um, of uh, talking to a lot of people uh, here and there around Africa working on agricultural productivity and um, wrote a book with Gary Tennyson. We called it uh, Securing the Harvest, Biotechnology, Breeding, and Seed Systems, Seed Systems for Africa's Crops. And you know the thesis that we put out there, I think, is pretty much still the one we're working on. So um, maybe that's why I decided to come back. Maybe we need some new thinking, some new ideas. Um, I certainly feel like uh, um, I could use a few. Uh, but the program has gained pace. We have uh, gone through a lot of money, <laughs> I must say. Um, that period of raising funds that you see there uh, in 2005, 2006 was almost uh, more successful than we'd originally intended uh, when the Gates Foundation came in and said, well, uh, how does $100 million sound? Uh, could, you, you, could you use $100 million if you wanted to get more seeds to farmers? And then the Rockefeller Foundation, not to be outdone, put up $50 million. And so, and ever since then, we've really worked at quite a large scale. And our, and our major struggle has been, you know, keeping it real, keeping it grounded in things that really work for farmers on the ground. Luckily, we had chosen a fantastic uh, uh, grounding instrument in you know, what we refer to not just as seed, but improved adapted crop varieties and then the supply of quality seed to farmers. But before I get started on that, I wanted to share just this little bit of really good news that is energizing our conversations at Agra these days. And that's that uptick that you see there in productivity in Africa. I don't know if anybody else has come across this data or whether people have tried to pull it apart yet. Or, ground truth it and see if there's anything to it. But it does look like we're no longer flatlining in uh, African agricultural crop yields, which is fantastic news. Um, and if you look at the national level, which we just started doing, um, I've got a series of these. And 
naturally, I chose the best. Uh, but it's also a place where we've done a lot of our work. Uh, Uganda probably uh, is the biggest per, ca per capita country for investment in the development of seed systems and improving farmer hold, smallholder farmer productivity. And as you can see, um, from 2006 onward, there has been a noticeable uptick in maize yields in Uganda, and those have been sustained. Now, you could just as easily ask, why have they plateaued? But then again, there is a little bit of an uptick again there at 2011. We've released a whole new generation of hybrid maize varieties that some farmers are coming back saying, we're getting, I'm getting six tons per hectare. Those are smallholder farmers who started out not more than 10 years ago uh, with one metric ton per hectare and have now graduated through a series of adoptions of, of improved technology, not just seed, but fertilizer and improved uh, agronomy and arriving at six metric tons per hectare. But that's in Uganda. No, let me digress a little bit and talk about what really kind of grounds us in, in what, you know, what we're trying to deliver through the program for Africa seed systems and through AGRA. And it's based on this scenario, and this is data taken from panels of 50 farmers each in Western Kenya who are using different sets of technology. And as you can see there, at, uh, on the far left, using a local variety that is a land race, basically, or a, a recycled, open-pollinated variety, and no fertilizer, the family is looking at misery. That's less than 110 per hectare, and there's no surplus there. There's, there's no food security. Just by adopting a hybrid variety, a family can add almost 50% uh, to its harvest. They could do the same thing just by applying fertilizer, but that costs about three times as much as the seed. And so what we see is farmers generally adopting the improved seed, and then when they see the crop come out of the ground, they run and go get fertilizer. So, you know, it's kind of, it kind of really is a catalyst to an improvement cycle and a virtuous cycle of, of improvements. And then ending up at the far end there, combining both better seed and better fer and fertilizer and getting almost two tons per hectare. But the thing is, it doesn't stop there because those are farmers who've just recently adopted the new technology and they can easily learn how better to use seed, how better to use fertilizer, how better to use other inputs and, and end up at four or even more uh, tons per hectare of, in, of maize. So that's, the, that's principle number one. No, no seed, no green revolution. Num principle number two is don't wish away Africa's often confounding and, 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 and uh, overwhelming diversity. And this has, I think, now been well appreciated. The variations and vagaries of rainfall and uh, climate and uh, elevation and the disease and pest complexes that those create, the different soils, it's there. It is the challenge. We can't take a one-size-fits-all approach to Africa's green revolution. This diversity results in a huge array of crop species and within each species a wide range of varieties. And what our approach, our conclusion from this is we're going to need a lot of plant breeders. We're going to need a lot of different varieties of a lot of different crop species if we want to have a green revolution in Africa. Number three was when we got to the point where we had some better varieties, we wanted to get them to farmers reliably, not just once, but on a regular basis. And we kind of went around, and timing is everything. We originally went to one of the big multinationals in seed and said, you know, here we've got some new varieties. Africa's time is now, and this was back in about 2002. And they thought about it for a minute, and they said, well, you know what? No, <laughs> we're not coming. <laughs> uh, and so it was a long trip back to Africa and, and uh, you know, kind of a sobering moment. But just about that time, some of the policy reforms that had been pushed across by groups like the World Bank and others um, were starting to filter through the system. And states no longer held a monopoly over seed supply. And so you could get 
a couple of these kinds of companies that I call two guys in a truck and 20 hectares or, and, and maybe a 20-year-old uh, tractor. And we said, that can be a seed company. And that really, that approach, as they say, has really made all the difference. So we've kind of graduated from thinking, well, seed is a public good, you know, governments can do it, and, and they can't. And we've, we've, we've gone through the phase where NGOs were sort of meddling around and doing some things with seed, and that didn't turn out very well. We've arrived now where we really feel like we need to build an African, a private African seed industry and treat seed as a business. Um, and then the fourth thing that we've struggled to keep you know, in mind is that this is not unique to Africa. This, it absolutely makes sense that Africa should be going through this uh, process, this challenge, or meeting, uh, addressing this challenge of feeding its people. Because we had the same problem right here in the United States. And if you remember, uh, or recall from history, that you know, in 1865, the country had just finished up with the Civil War. It was looking to agriculture to really power the economy. It had one major crop, and that was maize. And it put a lot of investment into the land grant institutions and the extension system. And uh, there was a lot of hope. And what happened? Well, as the data show, not a lot uh, happened. And yields were stagnant for the next 60 years average crop yields at just about the level they have been in Africa for the last 60 or so years. Although, you know, as we've seen, they're starting to creep upward. What changed all that was the introduction of better seed. And that has, you know, is a story that's still being played out as average yields across the United States continue to rise above even 10 metric tons per hectare. And so we've said, you know, first of all, if we don't get better seed to farmers, let's not expect any other different outcome. That absolutely is a sine qua non for Africa's green revolution. And second of all, it's not like we're working with bad farmers because U.S. farmers were not getting more than about a ton and a half per hectare using uh, the old technology. And I just wanted to flip through a few shots to kind of energize any of the students in plant breeding or agronomy in the room, the kind of contrast you can see, the kind of work that can come from your hands if you get involved in this kind of work. And we do have a long way to go. There's still plenty of time to make a career in plant sciences and, and crop genetic improvement in Africa. Um, although I have something to say about that in just a few minutes. On the left there is the land race in Mali. On the right, a beautiful hybrid. Um, here's another hybrid that we created using local germplasm, and as you can see, it's a wholly new creation um, from the National Ag Research Institute in Mali using some of the germplasm of the land race on the, on the left there, and, but, and, and maintaining a, a tall, sort of lanky, but open, and open panicled sorghum variety, but a hybrid that can yield now three and a half or four tons. And the Narika rice is not, not you know, you, you can't say too much about them. They're just, they're, they just need to get delivered to Africa's farmers. There's still, you know, delivery issues and, and, and some areas where they're best suited are still affected by um, insecurity, but they, they still have a, 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 an exciting future in Africa. And it extends to the legumes, as you can see here in the center of that photo, a field of beans that's been devastated by disease just by transferring in some yield genes and some um, disease resistance genes. You can transform bean crops now in Uganda, Rwanda uh, to the kind of crop you see in the foreground. We've just now released a new generation of groundnuts, Cercospora leaf spot and uh, uh, Rosette virus, we're just tearing up the crop in northern Uganda. It's a very important crop. And as you can see on the left there, one that's protected from those two diseases by just a few genes and a much better crop. Those varieties have now crossed the border into South Sudan, and we're getting ready to release those through an agreement with the ministry there. And this is the most recent thing that's really energizing the team uh, that I lead at Agra. Just look at that. I mean. 
This woman we met in the southern highlands of Tanzania. It's a quite a remote area, but a very high potential. And in her left hand is what she had been growing her entire life. And as you can see, it's one of those varieties that's likely to yield about 800 to 900 to 1,000 kg per hectare. And in her right hand is a hybrid maize variety. And this is a representative sampling of the crop that she had. That whole row was like that. And uh, we asked her, you know, what are you going to do now? And she said, well, I'm going to buy the seed of this hybrid. And she's, and, uh, and the, the, the thing that we kind of come away thinking about is that she knew that there was a hybrid around, that she knew that this, there, there was something you know, on the market that she hadn't seen, but had never seen it on her farm. And so we're really thinking about how to raise farmer awareness, because until somebody experiences something like that, you don't necessarily have uh, an adopter in Africa. Um, I'll skip this. We've done a lot of uh, investment in, in, in a lot of different things. We've, we've, uh, maybe I'll just to touch on this, because this is where you know, Ronnie and, and, and Margaret and Susan McCooch and Stefan and others have really made a huge contribution is in our training of especially PhD um, uh, fellows who have now graduated. About 56 have graduated. And that kind of sets the ball rolling. The kind of PhD that they do is a very practical kind. It's back in their home country dealing with a genetic problem of an important food crop. And then when they go back home after graduation, we chase them down and give them a grant. And then they, they get off and they start to do breeding of a new variety. But the whole point here is half of this is public sector you know, research, but fully half is really private sector and delivery. And the one thing I was going to say is that if, if you are looking for an exciting career in agricultural development today, I would, uh, 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, really the, the best place you can be is, is as a breeder. And today, I think I might have a different answer for that, or a you know, response there. It's, we really need business people to run seed companies. I mean, it's a stretch, but I could say the best thing for everybody in this room to do, really, is to go to Africa and start a seed company. Because there's such a huge vacuum in terms of delivery capacity, and so many farmers who, like that woman I just showed, are living without the benefit of improved seed and other technologies. And as, you know, we've, we've, we've come a long way. We've produced in 2012 about 57,000 metric tons of seed. But what can that do? That can plant about 2.85 million hectares of farmland. We calculate around uh, 5.7 million metric tons of additional food, sufficient to feed 33 million people. It's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, we're, we're, we need to accelerate the pace. Population growth in Africa, especially in the Sahel, and especially in, 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 in West Africa, but extending into even Southern Africa, is so uh, high that um, even this kind of result is inadequate to meet the uh, coming um, crisis, uh, unless if, if farmers don't get access to improved technology. Um, just to show you the kind of diversity we're dealing with, we're, we do, you know, invest a lot in maize. Maize is going to be Africa's green revolution crop. I think we can pretty much conclude that. But it has to be complemented by a wide range of other crops that are really better suited to the environment in the areas where farmers usually deploy those crops. And they need improved varieties of beans, millets, uh, sunflower, cow pea, uh, sorghum, even wheat in, in Ethiopia as well. And so we're trying to vary the cropping mix and the seed mix, the seed supply mix, depending on the environments there. So in a country like Malawi, which is very maize driven, maize is the primary product. But in Niger, as you can see in the upper right hand there, we're focused heavily on improved supply of millet seed. 
And we kind of play around with these things when we're sitting around having a beer at night and try to figure out where um, different countries are with regard to their stage of seed systems development. The point is, you know, we're trying to get everybody to move over toward one of these stages on, on the right. And it, in our approach, I often say we're not trying to pick winners. It's not about doing the whole job. It's about starting races that allow people to spill in and get ideas themselves and contribute their own energy and their own money to the challenge of delivering better technology to farmers, especially seed. Um, just to, again, reflection. What, what has been different about the approach we've taken so far? And as I say, we're actively looking for, we're seeking input on how to do this better. Um, but we think it's important that we, with a lot of help from Cornell University, <laughs> have, I think, reasonably well, uh, successfully transferred ownership of the inventive step to local people. And you know, there was a long time when, if, as a breeder in Africa, you were somebody else's technician testing their technology. These days, for a breeder to really self-respecting breeder to call themselves a breeder, they got to have their own segregating populations. They've got to be making their own crosses and thinking. And this has made a big difference, we believe. Again, I already said, treating seed as a business, not as something um, to do uh, when you get around to it or as a, a sort of campaign uh, solution, but as a grinded out, um, increase revenue and meet payroll kind of a business. Um, not just leaving it at business, but actually focusing in on the things that make for a successful uh, seed enterprise. And some of the people who led in the creation of this industry in other parts of the world are now in Africa. Dave Westfall, who you see there with the seed processing equipment, has been a, an amazing asset to us. You know, he's the kind of guy who can walk into a seed company and within five minutes tell you the top ten things that are wrong with it and, uh, and then get, get excited about fixing them. And then Abdullahi Sawadogo there you see proudly standing next to his um, new seed processing unit, which he bought and is now running and, you know, it powers his 2,000 ton per annual uh, seed company in Burkina Faso. Um, I already mentioned, you know, taking the seed, taking it to the farmer, basically, making sure that all of the farmers who need to know about the opportunity are aware. And that's a lot of hard work. And if you want to go to work for an NGO, if private sector is not your thing, here's a way you can really make a difference in the world. If you, you don't need to be a scientist. All you need to do is go out and find a way to inform farmers about the opportunity. Um, and then, you know, as I've said, emphasizing private sector, mom and pop businesses selling ag inputs by the side of the road has been a huge difference. We thought farmers would naturally come into these things, but we assumed too much. In fact, if you don't have these things for sale in your home village within a few kilometers walking distance, you're not likely to use them. And so we've invested heavily, over $40 million, in just developing uh, this, this uh, series of agro-dealers, as we call them. And then I just always want to give a shout out to my amazing team, uh, George Bagheera, Jane Aninda, Fred Mahuku. Uh, these are the true green revolutionaries that are working at Agra uh, in the SEEDS program. Thanks very much, and I look forward to the conversation. As I say, we're still looking for your input. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for your remarks, and I think that uh, specifically the narrative around the importance of the private sector is important because it's something that the students may not hear as much uh, here at Cornell or elsewhere as it pertains to agricultural development. And this also serves as a perfect segue into our next speaker, who has done a tremendous amount of work with the multinationals and within the NGO space as well. And, and these entities play, I think, a very important role in creating an enabling environment uh, so that the private sector can thrive. 
And so it's a, it's a perfect segue. And I want to start before I begin the, the bio, the brief bio. Uh, you know, I met, I met um, Peter Matlin this morning. And I think this story really uh, crystallizes the importance of Cornell and the, and the Cornell family. I met, I met Peter this morning, and he, he immediately asked me what I was doing and the projects I was working on, and then offered his black book of networks, uh, which included his wife, and so <laughs> who lives in DC, and I'm based out of DC as well. And I think that for students, that's one component that you, we can't emphasize it enough on the panel. And as young professionals, I mean, our network is really gonna make or break our careers. And so we have a strong academic foundation here, but also, you know, and some of the people that I'm looking out in the audience, I mean, you know, I'm not shy about leveraging my network at all, um, but it's, it's a tremendous amount of value there. Um, but uh, Peter actually is an adjunct professor here at Cornell, where he did his PhD work at the Dyson School. Uh, but in addition to that, he also chairs Africa Rice and the Global Fund for African uh, Women in Agricultural Research and Development. And he's also on the steering committee for Cornell's own uh, CFAT Center. Um, his past posts include managing director of Rockefeller's Africa Regional Office in Nairobi. He's a founding president of programs for AGRA, A Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, which Joe alluded to already. Um, he's a chief, he was the chief global program head for food security at UNDP. Peter is also a member of the Millennium Program's Hunger Task Force and the Inter Academy Council on African Agriculture. Uh, and, and in fact, the list of experiences could literally go on. I mean, very well accomplished. And uh, we love to hear your remarks and your experiences to date and how Cal's really added value to your career and positioned you. Thanks a lot, uh, Cahill. Thank you very much indeed. Kind words. Uh, as you look at the panel here, uh, I'm 15, 20 years older than anybody else. So my career has gone through uh, the full life cycle. And so what I would like to do is start off by describing a little bit of um, Cornell's influence on me uh, through the graduate studies that I did here, and then trace through my career trajectory, which has been anything but linear. It's sort of a case study in adaptive management. Uh, so first, Cornell. I did my PhD in ag economics, uh, the precursor to the Dyson School, uh, in 1977. And the strongest memories and influences that I take away from the school, first of all, some of the most inspiring and talented teachers that I've uh, ever met anywhere in my educational career. People like Dan Sisler, people like Ken Robinson, uh, people like uh, Bill Tomek, John Miller, Bud Stanton, who's, who's here today. Uh, these are extraordinary teachers and extraordinary human beings and were able to communicate to the students not just subject matter but what made for a meaningful life and a meaningful career. And I owe a huge debt of gratitude to those individuals. I was also influenced by the fellow graduate students, many of whom uh, uh, were foreign students that I went through. Extremely experienced, many of them were mid-career. Um, they were very challenging. They didn't accept necessarily what they were being told in the classroom, which I appreciated. Uh, and they held a lot of fun. We, I learned, I've often said I've learned as much from the fellow graduate students over beer uh, as I did sometimes in the, in the lecture hall. Really interesting, well-informed, challenging people. The other thing I appreciated about the Cornell graduate program was its flexibility. When I was choosing Cornell, I was choosing, I just finished a, a master's in public affairs with a focus in, in uh, economics of development at Princeton. And I was looking for tooling up, getting a set of tools in, in agriculture because my professor there, Sir Arthur Lewis, later a Nobel Prize winner in economics, said basically if you're gonna do anything in, uh, in development, you better know agriculture. 
So I looked at two schools. I looked at Stanford, the Food Research Institute, and I looked at Cornell. I picked Cornell because it was an ag college. And they gave me more flexibility to take courses in nutrition, <coughs> take courses in tropical soils, take courses in crop science, all of which I was able to do, thank God, due to the flexibility of our Ag Econ uh, program. Those courses have served me just extraordinarily well for the rest of my career because I was able to interact with people in other disciplines, understand the vocabulary, understand their, uh, their analytical frameworks. Extremely useful. The fourth really important contribution that, that my Cornell experience gave me was the opportunity to do fieldwork. Um, I did my thesis fieldwork in northern Nigeria, lived in northern Nigeria for two years, and for 18 months of those two years, I was living in a, literally in a mud hut without electricity or water doing interviews, farm surveys. Uh, interviews in Hausa. Um, that experience was extraordinary. To be in a village of, say, 200 people, it was 200, 250 population, uh, to watch them go through an entire agricultural cycle, to interact on a daily basis, six days a week with these people, share their um, frustrations, share their tragedies. Uh, I helped bury some of my uh, farmers. Uh, my, my Volkswagen at that time uh, was the local ambulance. Uh, I had three, I delivered three children in the back seat of my Volkswagen, uh, taking problem pregnancies to the local hospital when the local hospital was 100 kilometers away. Uh, it was an extraordinarily intense 18 months. Those 18 months living in that house of village gave me a framework and a lens that has served me extraordinarily well for the rest of my career. I cannot look at a problem, a program that's being put forward without reverting to putting on the, those glasses of how the farmers were seeing their opportunities, their risks, uh, how they managed uh, their livelihoods. When I finished up at, at Cornell, um, I really had no plan for my career. If somebody had done an interview of me uh, uh, to say, like, where are you going to be 10 years from now? It's a classic question that we ask when we interview people. What do you want to be five years from now, 10 years from now? I wouldn't be hired because I had no idea uh, <coughs> where I wanted to go. But I thought, let's start off with academia, have a chance to get some publications out of my thesis, and stick my toe into the academy, see whether or not I enjoyed uh, the university experience. So I was hired by Michigan State University and, and taught there for three years as an assistant professor. Um, after three years, I enjoyed the theater of the classroom enormously. I enjoyed the students, many of whom were from the Sahel. Uh, Carl Eicher at that time had a very aggressive program with USAID bringing in students from the Sahel. So many of the students, uh, I was on 11, I, I was chairman of 11 uh, thesis committees, three PhD and, and eight uh, masters, uh, which is almost criminal uh, because I had such a little experience myself, most of whom were African. It was a marvelous experience, but I missed the field, and I really wanted to get back and do applied uh, field work. So I had the opportunity, again, uh, very opportunistically. I was giving a paper um, in um, um, at Virginia Tech uh, in the AAEA meetings, and a fellow came up to me afterwards, uh, name of Jim Ryan, who uh, headed at that time the economics program at Icrasat, and he said, we're looking for somebody. Would you be interested to, to work in Burkina Faso at that time, Upper Volta? Uh, I said, I would love it, because frankly, I was getting frustrated with the academic uh, environment. 
So I was posted to Burkina Faso, worked as the farming systems economist on a multidisciplinary team of uh, eight, nine uh, technical researchers, breeders, uh, entomologists, agronomists, soil chemists, uh, pathologists. And my job was to uh, do the on-farm research. I worked with uh, farmers across the country uh, in six villages, uh, village surveys. If any of you know the Ikrasad village surveys in India, it was somewhat based on that model. My job was to um, do diagnosis of what the farmers' problems were what their wants were, what their desires were in terms of new technologies, and then to take improved technologies from the, our ICRASAT breeders to the field to test. I did that for seven years. And for seven years, we had the same pattern of results. The improved varieties always were outperformed by the local varieties. Once they left the research station, and got under farmers' management, even at similar levels of fertilization. So I did a lot of work on uh, yield gap analysis, trying to understand that, and try to understand then what were the characteristics of improved uh, sorghum and millet varieties that would in fact be adopted by farmers, and how could we achieve uh, the development of those, of those varieties. For seven years, I reported back in the uh, annual meetings my results and uh, worked with a couple of physiologists to develop a set of recommendations as to how we could change our breeding goals and, and, and methods. Uh, and absolutely no change occurred in the, either the sorghum or the millet breeding programs, none. They continued to reinvent the flat tire year after year. Um, I found that an incredibly um, enlightening learning experience, the, um, how organizational and uh, disciplinary um, inertia can prevent the use of valid empirical evidence to change directions within an institution, within an organization such as, such as ICRASAT. So I was frustrated and uh, spent a couple of years in Hyderabad uh, trying to advocate for a revisit of, of directions. And uh, again, opportunistically, I was approached by another CG center, uh, the West Africa Rice Development Association, uh, who inquired, would I be interested in taking on the role of, of director of research? This is precisely what I was looking for. In other words, I wanted the opportunity to be able to shape the agenda, to hire the people who understood the importance of performance under farmer's conditions, not just under research station conditions. I jumped at the chance and worked for uh, the West Africa Rice Development Association, WARDA, for nine years uh, based in, in the Ivory Coast. And in many ways, it was one of the most um, um, delightful, satisfying ex periods of my career. We moved the center from Liberia to Ivory Coast, developed an entirely new strategy. Uh, one of my first jobs was I had to terminate 35 PhD level uh, um, uh, scientists uh, and communication and, and training people and hired an entirely new team because Ward at that time had been ruled um, uh, basically fatal uh, by the donors and we had to reinvent it. It went through a major uh, change management exercise and I was part of that change management team. Uh, within uh, three years, we started the NUICA program that, that uh, Joe referred to. Uh, and within, I, I left in, um, in 97, and uh, within three years, uh, Warder won the World Food Prize for the work it did on the Narikas uh, with the scientists that I uh, was fortunate to be able to work with and to hire and to give them the space and the freedom to, to do uh, work in wide crossing. Enormously satisfying. Um, now, for family reasons, 
uh, I needed to return to the United States. Uh, there was an opportunity for me to join UNDP. I became the head of the Global Food Security uh, Program in UNDP, based in New York. And I stayed there for four years. Uh, this was not one of the most satisfying highlights <laughs> of my career. Um, if, if, if Harvard Business School were to run an exercise and design a dysfunctional organization, it might have many of the characteristics, the parameters of UNDP. <laughs> I found much better, really excellent people within UNDP, really motivated, enormous amount of experience that couldn't function uh, because of the structure. It's a case where the, the total was much, much, much less than the sum of the of the parts, very bureaucratic, very political. And during that period, we were experiencing a, a collapse in, in resources. So it was, it was a difficult time. I'm honored to have worked for the UN. I learned a lot in the UN. I learned what I would never do again, uh, <laughs> career-wise. And at a real low point in my uh, thinking, uh, I was approached by a Cornellian, talk about networks, uh, Bob Hurt, who was here uh, at a meeting. We were at a meeting in, in Durban, I think. And he asked me to meet him for breakfast. And he said, uh, would you be at all interested in joining the Rockefeller Foundation? Now, I know you're at the UN, but you wouldn't be interested in joining Rockefeller, <laughs> or would you? Um, I tried to contain myself. I, I <laughs> tried not to kiss him too openly. Uh, <laughs> And so I was pulled into Rockefeller Foundation in uh, 2001. Uh, first as the Deputy Director of Food Security, and then outposted to um, uh, Nairobi, where I was the Director of the, uh, Managing Director of the, of the Regional Program. The move from UNDP to Rockefeller was um, just um, uh, a, a wonderful feeling. I thought I had done, died, and gone to heaven. Rockefeller had focus. It had assured resources. It had little bureaucracy. It had tremendous flexibility and empowerment of program officers, and just a wonderful staff. Getting to work with people like uh, like Joe. Uh, high energy, great ideas, low maintenance individuals. It was a pleasure. I worked in Nairobi for, uh, for five years uh, as managing director. And again, it was a marvelous period. Uh, during those years, I was able to, to fund, help design, and fund and manage a number of initiatives that to this day I'm very proud of, the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, uh, now based in Nairobi. Agora, that many of you should know, the access to global online resources in, in agriculture. Award, the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development Program. And then AGRA, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa that, that Joe mentioned. Uh, the opportunity to be there at the conception of each of these programs and to contribute to the design and the early launching and management was, um, was phenomenal. So for family reasons, I retired in 2007. I'm now a professional trailing spouse, so I follow my wife to wherever, wherever she goes. But just in retrospect, I'm delighted that it was in late 2000, 2007 that I retired because having worked in Africa as a volunteer starting in the 1960s, and then professionally in the 70s and, and thereafter. We weren't seeing progress. The line that Joe showed earlier of the totally stagnant yields were mirrored by rising rates of poverty, rising rates of, of food insecurity. What we've seen since 1995, due again to the policy shifts that Joe talked to, has been a real renaissance in Africa, a resurgence in Africa. And we're seeing a lot of countries now taking off and becoming truly emerging markets and not less developed countries. So it, it felt good to leave, uh, stop my career, 
so to, sort of, uh, at a time when uh, things had turned really well. And there were many, many good stories out of Africa. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, very much for your remarks, and I think it really sets the stage for uh, Steve's remarks as well, because I think if I can be so bold as to pull out some themes within your remarks uh, around risk-taking uh, early on to work uh, in northern Nigeria, which is a risky place, and stepping outside of your comfort zone as well, and I think those are lessons that students can really learn and grow from as they position themselves early on for, for opportunities down the road. And I think that uh, Steve can really speak to, uh, because that, that seems to be a central theme within your career trajectory as well. Uh, and so let me, let me get through the bio real quick and then you can jump in. Um, in addition to, to Steve Sherwood's ex extensive list of publications, uh, Steve also uh, spent nearly two decades of action research in education and policy at the grassroots level. And, uh, in conversations with him, I think that the grassroots level is even sometimes extended beyond the NGO space, which I think will be interesting for the students to hear more about. Uh, he's currently working as a lecturer at Wageningen University. And did I, did I? Wageningen. You messed it up. Wageningen, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in the Netherlands. Uh, and he spends most of his time um, in Ecuador, however, where he also manages a farm that, uh, invite students to come volunteer, and uh, there may be some opportunities for some Cornell students uh, to volunteer on that farm. I don't know if I'm speaking. Yeah. So. Great. Great. Well, it's nice to see a bunch of older friends. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think my point of departure for my work is I, I don't so much uh, focus on administrative bureaucratic spaces. Um, you know, I've, I've worked across many types of organizations over the years. I'm very much interested in social spaces. And, and I'm not so much interested in uh, how change should occur, occur but what it, how it does occur in practice. And that's led me to my, most of my research is on self-destructive organization, how people self-finance and self-organize around really harmful behavior. So I study things like pesticide poisoning. I don't know how much you know about pesticides, and it's usually self-poisoning, but pesticides kill more people than wars and homicides combined. Um, I study, uh, you know, in the context of starvation and things that we're talking about in the official political discourse, I study overweight obesity, which many of you know is actually larger than undernutrition. Um, I study things like heating up the planet. How do we heat up the planet by three degrees? And how do we get s stuck on these self-destructive trajectories as forms of innovation? Okay, and what can we learn from those when we actually want to innovate in other directions? Okay, and that's taken me to question things like modernization. It's taken me uh, to question um, a lot of the things that we have embedded in our, our discourses about seed systems and improved varieties and some of the things we've been talking about. Okay, I work in a very different context. Um, I don't think we're gonna have much opportunity to talk about the content. I think we're talking a lot about the process of careers, at least that was the ostensible purpose. I think a lot of us have hidden agendas and we always throw out these other ideas to, to strengthen our, our ways of thinking and living and being. And so, um, so my work, and I've had trouble working in bureaucratic spaces like organizations. I find them extremely frustrating. I find universities extremely frustrating, NGOs extremely frustrating, because of the amount of bureaucratic time and how you can't work around the really inspiring ideas and purposes that we have. And I think that's something a lot of us share. So I've really moved across organizations, but I feel like my career is coherent as a body, and it really was sparked in many ways um, when I came to Cornell. So I wanna share that. I'm gonna focus on one piece of it, of, of a contribution that came out of my thesis that turned out being a 20-year commitment, basically a 20-year NPS project. Um, and, uh, and then I want to talk about what I'm really excited about now, because it's interesting. For me, this is coming to the field. I live in Ecuador nine, 10 months out of the year, and I go to the field to study universities, researchers, scientists. And, and so it's interesting to be in the field, to be embedded in this environment, and observing how people talk and how our discourses evolve. Um, 
but, but I live in a very different reality. And the reality that I see as an organic farmer plugged into the food sovereignty movements and, and the farmer to farmer movements in Latin America is very different than I hear people describing it, not just in a scientific community, but in the development community. Okay, and, and I'm interested in, in, in that difference. Um, so I need that clarity, and that's part of the reason why I come to the field, to, to watch people perform. Okay, so let's talk about this. I'm gonna call it a walk on the wild side. I study what's called the social wild, not how things should happen, but how they do happen. And, and I'm gonna describe sort of my journey in agricultural science and development practice, which I view as a single industry. And I'm not talking about science is homogeneous. I know in this room, you know, you're supposedly all university scientists, but I think there's huge diversity here. And I wanna talk about why that's so important. Okay, and I'll do that at the end. But like many journeys, mine started with an airplane, okay? And I wanna talk about something a colleague of mine talks about at Wagen again, and Paul Richards, he's an anthropologist, does a lot of research on uh, farmers and local knowledge. But one of the things that Paul has often told me, and he's often criticized my work, is he says, you know, I think Local knowledge is important. I think farmers are nice, but I don't want to fly in a socially constructed airplane. Okay? Now, what does that mean in practice? And so I want to introduce, this is a quadrant I often use to describe uh, bodies of knowledge. I do a lot of work on the politics of knowledge. And we're sort of cross-cutting here, right? The verticals really based on ontologies, you know, the extremes of, uh, the say reductionism and holism. The horizontal is about epistemology. Ontology is your worldview. Epistemology is how you sort of in question the world, how you make truth claims. And that goes from the left, which would be more positivistic, exogenous, expert, that, to the right, which is social constructivist, endogenous notions. Okay. But this kind of is an arbitrary way to think about it. It's a taxonomy. But I just want to get at the sort of four bodies, the kind of coherent bodies of knowledge. And, and we organize our politics around this. And the sort of things that are produced, for example, from people working in this sort of positivist reduction, reductionist uh, quadrant is you know, a solution like a pesticide. And people working in sort of the expert-led holistic view might come up with something like integrated pest management. You know, it gets a little bit more holistic as it and as we get into the constructivist space, the sort of people space, the practice space, you know, we might get into something like farmer-led technologies, things that primarily come from the field, so to speak, not necessarily from the experts. And here we might get into something like agroecology, depending on how you define it, organic agriculture, community-supported agriculture, things that come from the field. But in this case, it's not focused on a single technology, it's sort of collective. And I wanna bring this forward so I can talk about what Paul is. Paul is saying, okay, on, on the endogenous side, on that far side, you know, people do clever things, but we do need expertise to drop in, okay? And I don't want to romanticize lay knowledge any more than I want to romanticize scientific knowledge. Okay, I think there's limitations to each, but I do want to acknowledge the importance of the right. And particularly in an argument, I think this came out of Norman Uphoff, um, talking about, uh, SRI, okay, and trying to validate the strength of the endogenous approach. And one of the things that I thought was really important was when we think about the airplane, it wasn't invented by scientists. In fact, it was invented by a couple of redneck farmers from the Mideast. I'm sorry, from the middle, Midwest of the US. You know, the, the Wright brothers. And I think, you know, a lot of the interesting innovations, and they did so, by the way, in 1903, Okay, they invented the airplane, they did the first motorized piloted flight two decades before it was mathematically possible. Okay? And a lot of things emerge through our daily practice. Okay? But I also want to acknowledge the importance of perfecting that and how science can play a role in creating the device and evolving it on. But we need to keep in mind where things come from. So why did I come to Cornell? Okay, I have a farming background. Okay, I grew up on a farm. Um, I uh, did, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Central America. And I hung out for a couple more years working as what we call a sandalista. People in sandals working with the Sandinista movement in the late 80s. Um, and did sort of, and worked with what was called the farmer to farmer movement in its early days. And really became inspired and came to Cornell 
I had an economics degree. I was a liberal arts student. And I got out of agriculture because, you know, I didn't like growing up in a rural village, right, in a redneck rural part of the U.S. So my goal was to get into, like, international development, but to work with the World Bank, to work with some sort of, you know, um, interesting organization using economics as my motor. But after that experience of working with farmer to farmer, I got really excited about the potentials of grassroots development, the practicality, and said, I want to go back and study. And one of the things that, and you mentioned this, Peter, I think, is the importance of the flexibility. As a liberal arts major in economics, wanting to do, you know, dive into uh, agriculture, this is the perfect place to come. So I worked uh, you know, with Phil Arneson, actually, um, who was one of the key people. I worked in plant pathology and put together a really intensive two-year course work in soils, plant sciences, uh, plant pathology, systematics, epidemiology, statistics, and just got all that in. And that's really what I needed to be able to work, actually, because I was pretty much coming from this side, and I wanted to develop this holistic biological piece and the insights that biology would provide me. But at the same time, it was on a Friday, and we were, I was with the camel breeders, and we were having our weekly migration to the barn. And I met Meryl Ewert, right, as many of you know. And uh, Meryl um, and I were talking about this, and he knew a lot about my practical work in the field. And he introduced me to uh, John Dewey, um, you know, experiential learning, as well as uh, the, the Brazilian revolutionary Paulo Freire and his work on awareness raising. And so I combined both of those and, and worked with uh, what I called ecological literacy. Okay, and then what the term that's come out and uh, but it was really about creating a sort of intermediation between these two worlds. Okay, between a sort of positivistic and a social constructiveness, bringing the insights of biology to farmers, so to speak, in ways that would kind of help them see things in new ways. And that was sort of the, the approach I had in those days. And so I went as my MPS project, right? This is a master's in professional studies. Um, I was in the International Agriculture, uh, International Agriculture and Rural Development Program. I went to Honduras, and I spent a year, okay, living in, the, in communities. And I worked with Jeff Bentley, an anthropologist, to sort of map strengths and weaknesses of local knowledge. And we did so, and we identified areas where scientists can learn from farmers, places where you know, the taxonomies, for example, of, of farmers were far more sophisticated, for example, in the phenology of maize than anything you would find in your average textbooks. You know, they had 15 names of maize, and, and you could look at that and study it, where we had a lot to learn. Um, but we also identified these gaps, places uh, where farmers really knew next to nothing, things that were very small and things that were highly mobile, for example. And we identified these areas, and we built a curriculum around that. So we're using Paulo Freire's techniques of awareness raising, Experiential learning, John Dewey's ideas, to help open up people to, to the microcosms, right? And that was the idea. You, you know, the theory was if we help them see these, you know, these sort of hidden realities, they could work in ways that were far more explicit and strategic. And so one was nitrogen fixation, to help them discover what this is in a very clear way. We also worked a lot on insect metamorphosis, the existence of beneficials, we identified, you know, even though germ theory had been around for over 150 years, it still had not, in the scientific community, germ theory still had not entered the knowledge systems of rural people. So we spent a lot of energy helping them discover the existence of microbes and pathogens and those relationships. And we also helped people because there were pesticide problems. You know, we did things like fluorescent tracers to help the implicit poisoning of pesticides become explicit. And so we did a lot of research to help people discover these hidden realities. And so before I left my MPS, we got some big grants. I mean, people got really excited about this work. Um, and so we got a big grant from the UNDP, for example, to uh, introduce this at the national level in Honduras. So I worked with Zamorano to do that. We created a national IPM program, an international, uh, integrated pest management program for small farmers. And we got a big grant as well from the Swiss government to do it in Nicaragua. So it's really productive out of this small little NPS project. Next thing I know, you know, within a year's time, we were doing these projects in Honduras and Nicaragua. And I started working with CFAT at that time and made contacts with two entomologists from Berkeley who are now at the FAO, uh, Peter Kimmore and Kevin Gallagher. And when I met these people, things really started to happen. 
And what was interesting with Peter and Kevin is they were working on ecological literacy in Asia at this time, okay, but they had done something I had not done. I was focusing too much on individual problems, pesticides, soil fertility. They had linked it to the crop, okay, and the crop, and that was sort of their big piece that I hadn't thought of. In retrospect, it seems really obvious, but at the time it wasn't so obvious. So then I got active in, in supporting the farmer field school movement. And I won't go into the impacts of field schools, but my argument, the theory was, I won't go very far into it, is um, you know, with clear knowledge, okay, with explicit knowledge, farmers could do research, they could experiment in ways that were far more intentional, far more purposeful, and that should have concrete impacts. Okay, and I believe that as somebody coming from a rural community, when you discover you know, what is a nematode and you understand those population dynamics, you can start to experiment in your field much more clearly. Okay, and that knowledge can be powerful. And we've proven this time and time again. Um, you know, and here's studies as, I won't go into the details, I guess, of this, but, but what I will say is we found, okay, in our ex post research on field schools in the context that I was working, that farmers were capable of improving their soil management Okay, by discovering the existence of nitrogen fixation, for example. They were capable of decreasing their pesticide use, of better managing certain pathogens, and they were also capable of decreasing their cost on, on inputs, right, in ways that did not affect their production. So we found increases in productivity. You know, it depends on um, what scales you're looking at, but certainly at the farm level and sometimes even at the community level. And we're talking usually 35, 40 percent. It was really common. Often through changing, uh, particularly through fertilizers, learning how to use fertilizers far more strategically. Okay? Um, but if you want to look at a really good critical study, um, Hank Vandenberg and Janice Jiggins put together 25 of the best long-term, most rigorous studies into one single collective study um, that came out in 2007 that demonstrate, I would say, the potential of farmer field schools. Okay, because I wouldn't say field schools have necessarily had or reached their potential in terms of impact. But what I will say is we took off. You know, very little resources. We didn't have $150 million. In my case, I had a $250,000 grant okay? um, to multiply, to insert farmer field schools into the discourse of development in Latin America. Okay? We started out, in my case, I was in Honduras, in Nicaragua, I worked in Guatemala, in El Salvador, but when I began working with SIP, the International Potato Center, I moved south into South America, worked with people like Rebecca Nelson, who many of you know, um, continued to interact with folks in this room. Um, we started to um, do training of trainers in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, okay? And within a 10-year period, okay, we were able to, to form a cadre of master trainers in each of those countries to create national programs, um, and we implemented about 4,500 field schools, okay? Um, that directly reached s several hundred thousand farmers. Um, but, but what's interesting today is those programs continue, they've diversified, and we worked with about 160 organizations, okay? Very little money. Um, and field schools are now, and more importantly than just the field schools, the process of ecological literacy Okay, the way we worked, farmer-led experimentation, et cetera, was introduced to the discourse of development. Okay, it didn't exist. And for me, at least my participation in this, and there was a big network of people who worked with me and inspired me along the way, it all began with that little NPS project. And particularly with my coursework, unlocking the sort of microcosms of biology that I learned here at Cornell, and the relationship I developed with Merrill Ewert, okay, and the inspiration he gave me on linking this with how. Okay, and, um, and we also, by the way, sent a number of our trainers to, to introduce field schools in Angola, Mozambique, and Brazil, but right now they're national programs. Um, a couple of our trainers are master trainers, and we've been supporting that, and this work goes on. I haven't actually had any financing to work with field schools for over 10 years, but it continues to happen. I continue to be linked into it and, and supported in different ways. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to talk about field schools making a huge contribution because I haven't experienced that. When I go to see field schools right now, and I was recently visiting field schools two weeks ago, and I don't see this hallmark of high quality development work. I don't see the creativity. I don't see things I've never heard of. 
Okay, and a high quality experiential learning experience, a field school should take off and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And they are in certain locations, but not at the national level. And this is the research I've been doing um, is why. And so if we look at you know, these sort of niche level proposals down in the far right, when you introduce a field school as a methodology, it's people-centered and sort of on this constructivist side. As it scales up into sort of a more, you know, more highly stable rule set, as it becomes institutionalized in the bureaucracy, it gets gutted. Like, and we've watched this over and over again, and we've seen it with SRI sometimes. It's a struggle where people focus on these principles. But what we have is a translation, a transformation of the field schools where they start to change the administration, the curriculum is no longer focused on the cropping cycle, the discovery learning methods, the agroecosystem analysis, all these things get taken apart. And so we see that field schools scale up in size, but not necessarily in meaning. Now, I don't want to question the original potential of the field school because I'm very convinced about that. What I'm concerned about is the institutionalization okay, of these promising processes. And we could talk about seed systems. These things happen not just to field schools, but to other things. So these are the sort of things that I've been doing research on. And it's really led me to my most recent work. Instead of banging my head on the scientific, the development community, I've really been, I've kind of, we've decided to do a bypass. Okay, um, I've spent 10 years working with different organizations to try to uh, scale up these approaches. And I really don't think it's ever gonna happen. And the sort of work we're focusing now is back on this space of how change actually happens, what we call self-organization. And a lot of research on the heterogeneity of daily practice, for example, um, and to look at, for example, in the pesticide case, and this is at one diagram, you know, we find that people self-organize into about five farming uh, styles, five farming patterns. Some are high risk takers, others are very pragmatic, et cetera. And, and that self-organization is interesting. And we study these things by factors, um, factorial issues. We do a lot of cluster analysis around different themes to identify these patterns. And we start to look at things that don't make sense across the norm, what we call positive deviance. So for example, we see people have high productivity per area and low fertilizer use, okay? Or high productivity and low neurotoxicity, okay? Poisoning by pesticides. And then we go live with these people. We unpack, how are you doing this? We study this at the family level. And we study, how are you doing this? When the norm is poisoning, how are you guys continuing to produce what was zero poisoning, or low poisoning, et cetera, et cetera. So we study these, these positive deviants, and we look to them for inspirations. Examples that have emerged in the local context, they're time proven, they exist, you can't deny them. But they don't not dominate the norms of practice. And we're applying this, for example, to obesity, we're applying it to uh, fertilizer use, to water harvesting, marketing, a lot of areas. And this is really the research that my students and I are doing, agrobiodiversity management, et cetera. And we find over and over and over again these positive, interesting examples. And the next research question is, well, how can you give them oxygen so they start to influence and drive okay, the investment of organizational resources so they can become to dominate the norm? Okay? And that's something we can talk about. So I want to kind of conclude just on three points. One is the Wilbur brothers indeed invented the airplane. Okay, a couple of redneck farmers. Okay. I, and I want to say how important that is. And often science comes decades after this fascinating practice is already happening. Okay. So I don't want to discredit the importance of science, but I think we have to understand where can it make a positive contribution and where does the spark come from in this field of science in, in agriculture development? And where should we plug in? But the other thing I want to talk about is when we invent the airplane between farmers and scientists, we also invent the airplane accident, okay? The bads, most of the big problems we have today in agriculture, at least where I live, are associated with the past solutions. Okay, I mentioned pesticides. Great technology for a while, and then all of a sudden it becomes a huge problem. Fertilizers, uh, total tillage. Um, et cetera, et cetera, the management of seeds, the way we integrate in the markets. I'm not concerned about the generations of problems because I think there are huge things that have happened in the Green Revolution, for example, that were important and life-changing for many people. 
I'm concerned about getting stuck on self-destructive trajectories. Okay? When our ways of integrating markets undermine our agrobiodiversity, something's wrong. With good science, our soils should improve in, in fertility over time, not decrease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have to acknowledge that we generate bads, and we also have to acknowledge the politics and the self-organizational activity that's going on that gets us stuck on a really stupid trajectory. And I think agricultural science is stuck on a lot of stupid trajectories. Okay, and development. I don't want to focus on just, we're, we're a community working with modernization. And I think we have to get off of that. I'm not concerned about creating bads, I'm concerned about not being able to move beyond them. We get stuck in these really harmful technology, or these approaches. And my argument here is that change requires a new way of working. We need to stop focusing on a pathogenic approach, focusing on the problems, focusing on what is wrong, and we have to start looking at the heterogeneity of daily practice and start to look at what's working, what we call a salutogenic approach. What's working, why, and how, and how can we tweak it like the airplane to make it work better? Okay, and I don't see us necessarily doing that. And I see this, I'm really concerned about how things become bureaucratized. I'm concerned about, and we just had this discussion of Wageningen, how professors and ideas and knowledge are losing control of universities. I don't know if that's happening here, but at Wagering, and now we're, I'm now doing time cards. Today I had to do an eight-hour time card to talk about and charge out to different projects, student time, administration, research, which is absurd. You know, and, and I just wasted 10 minutes of my day doing that in the morning. But that kills us, okay? That's how we get stuck on these trajectories. And I think really we have to find how do we recover these spaces of the emergence of these positive deviants in ways where they start to drive social and technical change. And my argument is it involves a walk on the wild side. Taking, getting away from our institutional space right now, which I feel has really become self-destructive in our fields, and entering the social wild of people's daily activity. There's just far too much distance between our sort of narrative and discourses in science and how change is happening in practice. And that involves a step out of the comfort of our organizational spaces, and a step into these realities we're pretending to work with. Sometimes that can be a physical step, sometimes it can be a social step, an economic step, et cetera, but we need to get real. And I invite all of us to take a walk on the wild side. Thank you, Steve, for your remarks. And we promised an interactive discussion. And so now we would like to move to the Q&A portion. Um, so we want to open up the floor for questions. Uh, please. We can lead the discussion over here, but we'd love to hear from the students and faculty as well. Yes? Um, my question is for Joe. I was wondering, your talk is mostly on seed crops, but recognizing the difficulties, you have comments on commonly propagated crops like sour sweet potato, they're also important savers. Yeah, um, we do a lot of work on the vegetatively propagated crops, um, bananas as well, cassava, sweet potato, really important food uh, security crops, and a lot can be done with them. Um, I could go into the story line in each of those, but um, just to use an example, um, we've managed to develop cassava varieties that have viral, virus resistance to both well, the two major viruses now that are prevalent in, um, in East and Southern Africa, uh, cassava mosaic disease and uh, cassava uh, brown streak disease. And we've put them in high dry matter uh, varieties, which was a big problem with farmer adoption. Um, farmers in that part of Africa need high dry matter. High dry matter delivers more calories anyway, so it's a better crop, really. Um, and then a tremendous, a, a brilliant piece of breeding work that was done by Maria Andrade, um, which we funded, uh, to combine high vitamin A content with high dry matter content, drought tolerance, and disease resistance. And those varieties are now getting out. There's a story behind how to get the varieties out too, but I won't go into that. But there, there, there are exciting, there are better and worse ways to get um, vegetatively propagated crops out as well, basically involving farmers as entrepreneurs. They won't be 
are the attraction, attractive investments for private seed companies. But farmers operating as seed, mini seed companies can shift the material very quickly as well. Any other questions? Any more questions? Ed. My question is to the end of the test. Uh, it looks like uh, the cross cutting thing there was a field experience, like had an impact on the areas and the project of the areas. I think it's fair to say, maybe in terms that I mean, agriculture economics, that is becoming more and more available. It's been collected by big institutions like World Bank and being also big areas. And maybe the uh, justification for the graduate student to go out there and collect data on their own becoming less and less. Could you perhaps comment on what we speculate if you have not had that experience, the field experience, maybe why your career would have it up, and maybe suggest ways for students to get that experience if they can't get it through uh, graduate success in the field work? You're, you're right that um, definitely for me, field experience was um, foundational to how I saw the world and uh, problems that could be addressed to improve lives around the world and, um, and you know, just my own worldview. And I think, um, it, to me, it doesn't really matter that data is more available. I mean, it's, it's good because um, I think more can be done with openly available data, but to really understand the context where it comes from, um, for me has just, <laughs> it, it's just allowed me to understand the data. Um, I don't think I would otherwise. And I think that's, um, you know, Cornell drew me because of the opportunities for international work and, and the ways that I approached that um, as an undergrad at least, were actually because so many faculty had uh, programs that involved international work, either through the grad students or directly. And so um, I'm not sure how that looks now, but I would imagine there's still, you know, it, it sort of involved a certain amount of, uh, of entrepreneurship, I suppose, in just, just finding, finding those faculty who did international work that was interesting. Um, so I think there's still probably a lot of opportunities that students could individually try to try to do that, um, and maybe some opportunities that are more managed for like internship programs as well. That, but but yeah, any kind of international experience. Just um, I think I think Peter was talking about how much that affects um, use, using that lens of how farmers might see things or how. Um, child care takes place in a home, uh, or however that is, it's, you can't replace it with data uh, on the computer. And I actually think that's a great point, is it's absurd that as researchers you can't actually dive into your data, right? And we know how important that is. And for me, that's precisely what we're talking about, what we call in sociology organized irresponsibility. Okay, we've organized ourselves in such a way that we can't even have contact with the realities we're working with. Um, and that's part of the problem. And that's precisely what I mean when we need to get out of doing research in the context of abstraction. We need to do it in the context of practice. We need to be held accountable. We need to live the consequences. This needs to be intimate. Okay, um, and, and I think there's one colleague talks about it, it's like childbirth. You know, you don't promote participatory childbirth. Development is like giving birth. You have to experience it, it needs to be intimate. And I think that's part of the problem with research and agriculture. I don't want to say, now research is huge, but the kind of research in agriculture, international agriculture and development is so abstract. The people in NGOs, by the way, are also not getting into the field, right? They're so caught up in their bureaucratic lives and realities and filling out time cards, they have very little connection and consequence. And that's the qualitative leap we need. We need to move from what we call mode one research, which is research in the context of abstraction, to mode two, which is research in the context of application. And, and I think that's the qualitative step. And just like you described, it's, you can't do it if you obey the rules today. We need to break the rules. You need to go out and find these crazy researchers here who still manage to do international work, if that's your interest. Do work in the field and start supporting what they're doing. And I know there's many people in this room that are already involved in that. 
we have to break some rules and start to create a new organization where this is the norm and not the exception. If I, if I could just add something you said um, there made me realize that um, now that I'm working for these international institutions, um, I, I realize how much as a student I sort of took for granted the international opportunities, um, sort of the chance to go, you know, in many different countries I lived with a family for months at a time. And that's just the way that students did international work. And now, I guess I didn't really think about it, but I thought that's how everybody did international work. And working for the World Bank is sort of, now I see colleagues there who have so little opportunity to actually integrate into a community like the way students can. So good thing I did that <laughs> through um, education. The point I wanted to make is, um I worry sometimes about elite institutions, uh, students from elite institutions like Cornell, um, kind of trying to take shortcuts to high level careers. Um, I don't know if there's, if, when's the last time I, I met a Harvard grad who'd been through the Peace Corps, you know? It just, it just, it just doesn't happen, you know? And uh, you, in, in my experience, I meet a lot of people who have that sort of disconnect between their understanding of the principles of their field and their understanding of reality on the ground. So if you're coming out of Cornell and you want to go into international development, I would say make a beeline for the ground level experience. You do have an advantage. It's that fantastic education. But you're not really going to make the best use of it until you've coupled that with uh, extended experience at the basic level of your field uh, through a two-year or three-year. Uh, I, you know, I did my own volunteer work. I bathed in the river. I caught every disease that all the other people around me were getting, mm -hmm. and uh, I wouldn't have ever wanted to skip that. I would never want to leapfrog just because you know you had a better education perhaps than some other people. Yeah. James. Uh, thank you, Alan. And I guess my question is sort of related to the last one in that uh, I'm a PhD student in plant breeding, and one of the things that we hear about a lot is specialization, especially as you're getting towards your career, you know, specializing in a specific aspect of your crop or of your system, and that that's sort of the way for the future understanding these technologies in a way that you can really sort of make a name for yourself. And yet, one thing that occurred on this panel today is a lot about how much of a role collaboration plays in your career. And I'm wondering, you know, we all have to work within the systems that we have to some degree, but what would be your suggestions for those of us who are interested in international careers like you've described as far as gaining these soft skills, as far as gaining these experiences in collaboration well, not sort of annoying too many of the bureaucrats or our poor suffering advisors, you know, while trying to do our PhDs. Any suggestions? Could you talk to me? Yeah, let, let me just uh, make the first comment. I think there's no question that if uh, you are working in international development, you need to develop the most cutting edge applied tools uh, that are available. You've got to bring uh, value addition to whatever um, occupation you go into. You have to be more valuable than somebody else. And if those cutting edge tools are in fact help you to solve a problem, address a problem and solve it, you need to have those tools. Um, but at the same time, you need during your, I would suggest during your university education, to um, uh, study, read, interact as broadly as possible so that you can identify the uh, accompanying skills that you will need for a successful career. And I do think it does mean some exposure to uh, the social sciences. It means some exposure to even political science. It, it means to be able to work in a 
uh, the dynamic of a, of a developing country uh, where you're not uh, at sea, where you understand where you are, you understand the context, you understand the institutional political dynamics. And then, once you have that, that uh, your feet on the ground in that understanding the environment, you can take your cutting edge applied tools and make a difference. Um, and I'll, I'll use this opportunity since I've got the mic to just raise another maybe provocative uh, uh, question. When I launched my career in the 70s and 80s, it was a period when there was a true shortage of skilled, high-level uh, people in, in African countries, Africans. And there was a need, there was a shortage of people that did what I was trained to do. So there was, a, I was filling a gap. I think we all have to be honest and ask ourselves, does that situation still hold? There are many um, situations where there are surplus, uh, extremely well-trained African uh, scientists, policy makers, trained at the same universities that we are, who know the context better than we ever will, and they are underutilized because resources continue to go to the CGIR centers, not to the NARS. They go to US universities through BIFAD, not to African universities. Uh, I think there's a it's, it's a real question of how we can optimize the use of, uh, uh, speak in the African context, African human resources. And I don't think we're close to having a level playing field uh, in terms of the power balances uh, in, ter in the international development community that makes that possible. One of the really exciting and attractive uh, elements of AGRA is that it is focused on um, bringing resources to really talented African breeders, economists, and, and, and businessmen, and so forth. So is there still a role for expatriate northern uh, people in international development working in that environment? Or is your future really more appropriate at a US-based university that's collaborating uh, over there, uh, or in, in, in industry, because what we don't want to do is outcompete. Uh, we don't want to disempower. We don't want to crowd out the very, very skilled African uh, human resources that are, that are now out there, that are now there. <coughs> so raising that question. Thank you for that point. Um, we have time for just about one more question. Hi, my name is Eve Carmel Bruce. I'm an NPS student here. And Peter, I want to thank you for your comment because that was going to be my question about the field of international programs and international development. Um, do we really have folks who are culturally fluent and who are really um, able to be part of the uh, communities that they're seeking to serve because they actually are from those communities? And is there a shift to really ensure that we're bringing in development folks um, who are diverse? Because um, oftentimes when I do work with folks at the IDB, the World Bank, IFC, I don't see many folks who look like me. Um, and I think that's very problematic. Um, the second question I had was related to something you said, Jim, in a uh, conversation that I was having with Ed around um, training individuals who are also entrepreneurial and who are also looking at development. I find myself running back between the Johnson School and CALS, um, and though we have some great programs that have some links, I don't necessarily uh, really see a uh, programs or thought processes where you have entrepreneurs who are taking all of those skill sets in one um, and working in development. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um... I really think the magic now is where public you know, interacts with private. Uh, and by private, I mean SME type, you know, small and medium sized enterprises, who tend to be the nimble ones, the, the creative ones who find solutions on the ground that you know, can be used by local people as opposed to multinational corporations. Um, you know, 
that's where I think there you can probably do the most. We, there's been an almost, there really has, has been an embarrassing overemphasis on thought and research and analysis with regard to development. Very, you know, far, far too little emphasis on delivery of what we know to the poor people who need it. And um, I think that's partly because we're so ignorant of how private sector works to deliver goods to people, you know, as academics. And uh, a lot of times, you know, we need to just get out of the way and bring in people who really know private sector to, to, to complete the equation. Um, so if you get experience, uh, you know, running a company, uh, I think you can be more valuable in the future in African agriculture development than you could be just as a standard sort of uh, uh, functionary. I love this situation that just occurred. Um, a, a young guy who got an MSc in plant breeding from the, one of the Midwestern universities um, and then worked for Beck Seed in the Midwest found himself uh, working for, is, is now working for a company in Uganda out in the bush in a place called Hoima. And they've got uh, varieties they're now excited about taking to Burundi. I don't work in Burundi. I have invested in that company, and I've invested in the genetics that they're going to transfer to Burundi. But it would take those guys, those kind of crazy, um, young, you know, thinking completely, you know, without boundaries kind of people to get that seed into Burundi. It's going to make a big difference, I believe. So for me, that's where the magic is. We have our last Okay. And I think this is a good example. I generally agree with both of what you, what you both said, but I also specifically disagree. And I think this is a good example where we get trapped in our metaphors. Um, I have no trouble with uh, being a, an American, you know, living in Latin America for 25 years, um, and me working in that context as an expatriate. And I have no trouble with, for example, an African working in the United States in development. Um, I think we have to get away from the metaphor of nationality. I think the, the deeper purpose in what you're both getting at is a sense of accountability, the sense of local, of living in some sort of context where you're responsible. And often, as a farmer, I know much more about Ecuadorian agriculture than an urban Ecuadorian who's never touched soil in his or her life. And, and so the farming connection connects me to that reality and not me being an American. And even if I don't speak Quechua, I can still interact on an intimate level because through the soil and bugs and these sorts of things. And the other one is the business metaphor. And, and I, I generally agree with what Joe's saying, but I also specifically disagree. And I think, what are we talking about business in this context? And I think the deeper, what I get out of Joe's comment is not so much being an entrepreneur, the business metaphor, as it is the deeper idea about business, which I think means being productive and also being regenerative. You know, so the relationships that you generate, for example, in development activity, um, aren't just about accumulation of wealth and the other notions that we have in, when we think about business. They're basically productivity. And so you know, what we're generating are, are value and development. And it also has to be regenerative. It has to be a good business model that can self-finance and grow and diversify. And these sort of, and, and, and so I don't want us to get trapped in our narrative as development professionals. I think it's a moment when we have to think more deeply, step out of our narrative, step into the social wild, and start to generate new ways of thinking, organizing, and doing around development. And we're not doing it yet. We're stuck at our narrative. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's a, a perfect concluding remark so we can have some, some interesting discussion in the atrium as, over cocktails. I think it gets even better then. So thank you. We want to thank everyone for coming out. We want to sincerely thank our distinguished panelists, Sarah. And I want to thank, thank our very talented, dynamic, and distinguished moderators. Yeah.